I'm going to teach you how to recover low resolution, overexposed, underexposed, grainy, light flickery footage that was shot in the incorrect white balance with one simple method in DaVinci Resolve. This is a follow along tutorial, so quickly start the download for both the absolute worst clip I could find in my entire video archive and this tutorial project so that you can double check your settings against mine and look at things at your own pace. Keep watching whilst that downloads as I want to quickly talk about why this clip was filmed so badly as the best way to fix a video is to understand and shoot correctly in the first place. It's 2020, I'm in Bali and on day two of a project where I just said yes to filming everything. This is the first good mistake to learn from. Whilst it's great to achieve lots, know what you can do in a day and set boundaries. The closer you are to the limit, the more likely you will make even basic mistakes that you outright know you shouldn't be making. Let's break down the clip. The first error is that the lights are flickering. This means that the camera is set up in the wrong format for the location that I'm filming in. I had just flown in from another country that operated on 60 hertz electricity, so it was an NTSC. But Bali is 50 hertz electricity, so my camera is not taking frames in timing with the lights that are alternating between on and off so quickly the naked eye cannot see the process. The camera should have been set in PAL. I hadn't noticed this because I was trying to do too much, and until now everything had been filmed outside so I hadn't had to deal with lights since landing on the island. The lesson is to check the refresh rate of electricity every time you land in a new country, and switch to the correct format, or pay extreme attention to flicker and botch it with variable shutter speed. But personally, I think it's just easier to set up the camera correctly in the first place. The second error is using the wrong pitch profile for the amount of light that I had available. This was a run and gun situation, there were no lights. Whilst I wasn't shooting in log, I was shooting in a higher dynamic range profile that I had just been using for everything. At night, you only have about six stops of dynamic range, so especially in this case where lighting was extremely poor, the image would have been better if I had a shot in a more compressed picture profile, which would have assigned more data to the shadows and made them much more robust from grain. The third error was not exposing correctly. I should have been using zebras at 70% to identify when the skin of my subject was getting too bright or not bright enough. Finally, the white balance is just wrong. I'm actually dual band colorblind, so back before I had processes in place and truly understood graphs, it was quite common for me to really mess this up. Let's fix the clip with just four nodes. The first step to fixing clips is to accept that you cannot save every clip. With time, you will learn what you can save and what you can't, but don't hammer time into something that you cannot fix. For reference, this clip is probably at the limit at what I would bother saving in the absolute worst circumstance. I shot much better clips of the event and even reshot the specific clip immediately upon review, so I usually wouldn't bother with something this bad. For step two, it's worth understanding that the processes required to bring this clip to a usable state are computationally intense. So we are going to do it all on its own timeline, then render it in place at the end, so you have a clip you can actually use and manipulate with things like speed ramping on the project timeline as if it was a well shot clip that was done correctly in the first place. Select the clip and then head over to your inspect tab. You can see that we have a 1080p clip at 119.88 FPS. Make a new timeline, name it, uncheck use project settings to make sure that the resolution and frame rates match the clip and make sure the monitor matches those settings. Then make sure that your color space matches these settings if you are outputting to YouTube or social media. If you want to know why, I've put a link in the description, but it is basically so that what you see on your screen is how it's actually gonna be when it is delivered to YouTube. Just means you can really ace the look and know that the final result will look exactly like that. Step three is to drag the clip onto the timeline and cut it down to exactly what you need. This will avoid wasting time for effects to run or be rendered on parts of the clip that you're never going to use. You can adjust this later, so don't stress too much on it. For step four, we're going to jump over to the color tab. It's worth noting that I'm giving you the absolute bang for the buck simple solution. This isn't exactly how a highly experienced and expensive colorist would approach it, but it will get you 90% of the results with 10% of the knowledge and much less time. If you do know how to set up color space transform for your camera, 
go ahead. I'm skipping this for simplicity and because we have it covered enough from setting up our timeline color space settings correctly. We're going to jump over to the color tab. For node one, our clip is such a mess that we are going to have to fix exposure and white balance before we can move on. As I mentioned earlier, I can't trust my eyes, but neither should you. You shouldn't be eyeballing stuff, you should be using the graphs. So come down to the bottom right, click on your little graph icon, which is called scopes, and then you'll see that you have waveform or one of the other scopes currently shown. We're going to be using a mix of waveform and vector scope to fix our image. Start on waveform and then jump over to your primary wheels. Make sure that you are on this one, not the one with log written on it. The first thing that we want to do is pull our image into our waveform. So at the moment it's peaking over the top. So we're just gonna pull down the gain and you can see that we have a little bit of recovery. There was some information that was pure white that was crushed against the top of our Rec. 709 profile, but we've been able to bring it back in. If you don't fully understand waveforms, I'll link a video down below for you to have a look at and get familiar with them. Now that we can see everything in our image, it's time to fix the white balance, which is effectively the mix of how bright your red, greens, and blues are. So it's something that you really sort of want to dial back a little bit, get it sort of close to being right before you start playing with exposure, because it's going to adjust the exposure of certain things, especially our skin here at the top, which has the reds pulling out quite strongly. To do a good job of this, we want to white balance to the skin because our subject is the most important thing. If the skin's off, then the whole image feels off. Whereas the color of the wall could be any color, the color of the lights could be any color. So we're going to actually switch over now from our waveform to our vector scope. Click on the settings and make sure that you have your skin tone indicator on and your settings basically match what I have here. It's also worth jumping across to this little menu here and making sure that your low pass filter is off. This basically takes the noise out of your image but we want to see that because as I mentioned we don't want to trust our eyes we don't want to be eyeballing things we want to do it precisely based off what the graphs are telling us because we want to be white balancing our skin and we don't care about the rest of the image what we can do is jump across to our qualifier and basically get a skin grab if you click and drag you'll see that we start pulling in um, certain parts of the skin but to make it really clear click on this little button up here and what that's going to do is let you see just what the color grab, the qualifier has actually selected. You want to make sure that you have a good range of skin tones. So you want to also get the shadowy bits as well as the brighter parts of the hands. You can literally click and drag over this. This is going to pull in other bits of the image, but it's cut out most of the stuff we don't want to be seeing on a graph. So we can see at the moment that we aren't actually on that line that we want to be aiming for, and it's a little bit off. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to our RGB mixer. We're going to make some minor tweaks just to pull these skin tones back onto that line. What these do is allow you to target the brightness of the reds, the greens, and the blues. And really what you want to do is look at your vector scope. And then as you pull these around, look at how it's pulling your vector scope around. So your goal really is to pull this back onto that line. And this is just something you'll get the hang of to as you play with it. But you can see that by tweaking with each of these very slightly and watching how that graph gets moved around, you should be able to realign it over the top of our skin tone indicator, which is gonna mean that our skin tones are right regardless of what our eyes or brains are telling us. So if we jump over to our primaries and our waveform, we can see that our red is still really pulling out. It's, it's slammed across the top there and it's not very close with the green and blue that's coming out of our skin tones here. So we really need to bring the gain of our highlights down. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to jump over to the one that I said not to go on earlier, log, and I'm literally just gonna pull some red out of the highlights and you can see us pull that down and bring it a little bit closer. I'm gonna jump over to my vector scope to make sure I've not messed with that too much. It's pulled it across a little bit, but we are still just about hitting that skin tone line. And because you kind of have to play with the information you have available, I'm actually going to say that is okay. I can also see that I have slightly too much green in this image. So when you have skin tones, often the greens lean slightly into the blues. So I am just gonna make my tint very slightly pinker which again is gonna pull those reds out a little bit. So you can still see we've got a lot of red in this image. Now, if we go ahead and turn this off, our image looks disgusting. And that's because we've still got that qualifier on. So all I'm gonna do is reset the qualifier and you can see our before and after here. 
nothing crazy, but we're starting to get a much nicer image to work with. The next thing that I'm gonna do is really make this a punchy look. And the reason we're doing this is because as I jump over to curves and start bringing in my S curve, you'll see that all the noise starts to get compressed as we make it a more punchy look. So I'm literally going to just push a little less curve into this that's perhaps a little bit more aggressive than it needs to be, but it's gonna help with the noise, it's gonna help recover the image. So that's the style that I'm gonna go for. I'm also gonna jump back over to my primaries, jump back over to this wheel here, the main primaries where we're not looking at the highlights and stuff. We want the actual lift, gamma and gain. And then I'm also gonna bring that gain back very slightly because again, we are leading up at the top here. And by doing that, we've actually pulled the reds out again, so I'm going to bring them down very slightly. I'm actually gonna do that by offsetting and pulling away from the reds. So I'm gonna go about there, which is bringing some green back into our image, but what it's majoritively doing is pulling out the reds and adding a little bit of blue to the image. And what this offset is kind of equivalent to is like a teal and orange LUT that you might slap onto your video. Um, that's basically what teal and orange is. You've pulled out the reds into the blues, added a little bit of green to it, and that makes skin tones real nice. And you can see that our skin tones now compared to before where they're really stretched out and we've lost the reds, we've really dialed that back in. Jumping back to our vector scope just to check again, you can see that we're quite nicely on that skin tone line, so I'm happy that I haven't pulled it too far out. So that is node one done. We've got our image to a somewhat usable state. It is nowhere near finished yet, but what we want to do next is fix these burnt out highlights. Yes, they're back in our graph. So if I switch back to waveform, we haven't got anything burnt out. So if your image looks kind of like that, where you have a line at the top, you're really gonna struggle to recover that. That probably means it's very overexposed. Um, you can get really aggressive with your graphs to try and break that. Likewise, if you've got the same thing at the bottom, if you've got a very strong line like this along the bottom, you might really struggle to pull that out. But as a whole, pull it down, see if you can bring back the information. So let's look at bringing back some detail to our highlights, to our skin at the top there. We're gonna press Option S to make a new node or Alt S if you are on Windows. I'm gonna click and drag this on top so that you can see that it really is kind of like layers. We have layer one, layer two. It's just in nodes, but it's connected with these lines that basically allow us to manipulate how those layers work together. What I'm going to do is jump over to the primaries for our highlight recovery, and I'm going to ignore the rest of the image. I'm just gonna get the hands to how I want. Stretching our gamma out is gonna pull out detail in those hands, and I'm actually also gonna bring the gain up a little bit. And basically, I'm just gonna get the hand to the point that I'm happy, which is perhaps going to be a little bit more aggressive. But you can see that we're, we're bringing back a lot of detail, we're bringing back shadows, we're effectively stretching it out with the gamma, and then we're pulling it up with the gain, and that's making our image much nicer. So now that we have our hands, all we wanna do is jump over to that qualifier tool that we were using earlier, and we only want it to affect the very bright part of our image. So we're gonna bring the luminance right up until you can just see it starting to play with the hands. And then we're just gonna put a softened edge on the low and adjust it until it works exactly how we want and makes our image look exactly how we want. I'm going to go about there. So if I turn that on and off, you'll see before and after, we've really pulled that back down. Now you're basically at the end of stage one. So this is where you wanna make some little tweaks. If I click back down to node one and then click on my primaries, we can make some little adjustments here. So at the moment, I'm probably looking to be a little bit too saturated. We've got quite a lot of space on the hand still. And because there's so many light sources, we've got a light here, we've got a light here. There's about two different types of bulbs up in the roof. Um, there's another light back here. It is basically a filmmaker's worst nightmare. So if in doubt, take some saturation out. Um, I'm gonna pull this down a little bit just to knock off how aggressive all the lights are and bring us to a much flatter image. And you can see as we make little tweaks, it's gonna start playing with things. So we actually wanna bring the gain of that down a little bit. Well, you really don't want your skin tones going above 896. So really try and keep that as the brightest that your skin tones get. And I'm also going to adjust my curve here to bring the hands up a little bit and bring this across. And it's basically just a matter of tweaking the image now until you're happy with it. 
It's worth jumping over to different parts of your image and making sure that things line up. So although I was aiming for my skin tone to be at 896, you'll see later on we actually have that bottle cap come out. And to make that look like the correct brightness, we actually needed to go back up to our node 2 and bring the gain down very slightly and then use the curves to effectively bring that image back to where we want it to be. So you can see lots of minor tweaks. Have a play with your image. Get it right because this is the base that you're going to be working from. I'm not going to add node 3, but if I wanted to bring more out of the shadows, this is where I could target them. So if I were, I could do option S or OS again, and then you could bring your shadows up and you could tweak around with how you want those to be. Um, once you're happy with them, similar process, but rather than coming from the bottom, we're going to bring down the high so that it only selects the bottom part of our image and then you would add the high soft. So that's how you would individually target the darker or brighter parts of your image and get them just right. Let's have a look at our before and after. So this is what we've got now, this is what we used to have. As you can see, not perfect, but when you play this and we fix the other little bits that are wrong with this image, you will actually be able to get away with using this clip. I'm actually going to bring this to a slightly more punchy look, so that's really actually missing a little bit of contrast there. And again, getting that more punchy look is going to help us with our next step. For those of you on Studio, if you press Option S, make a new node, go to Deflicker and set it over to Fluorolite, fluorescent light, then you will see it's going to do a very good job of removing that flicker. It is still gonna have some flicker in it. Now, it's up to you. You can either make a new node and sort of double it up. I have found is the best way to remove extreme flicker like we have here. You can see it's slowed the computer right down because it's really starting to struggle. Um, if you do need to use the whole image, you'll see that it will start getting a bit warpy around lit areas. What you could do is also delete that and then crop your image in and lose a little bit of resolution. But we can bring that back with some upscaling later. I'm also going to pull the image down a little bit and keep his hand on the thirds line and basically really focus on the bottle pouring, which is what we are looking at. If I jump back to the color tab, you can see that even with that one node now, we have a little bit of pulsing, but it's much better. I think for this particular image, it's so bad that without some additional tweaking, it's just gonna be easier to slap the second D flicker on, and that's going to basically remove everything from our image now. But with that done, we have recovered our white balance, our exposure from both the bright and the dark, and we have removed the flicker. So this is looking really nice now. It's tiny bits of flicker in the background, but at the end of the day, when this is playing normal speed, when people are watching it for the first time, when they don't know the video was damaged, they're not going to see this, and this is the worst possible clip I would bother recovering. I'm counting those as one node, so we will open up our next node for the final bit that we're going to do, which is denoise. So if you type in noise, you will find noise reduction, and we can look at our settings here. Noise reduction is broken into two different settings. We have our spatial and our temporal. Temporal looks at the frames before and after, and tends to produce a much sharper image. Spatial sort of looks at the single frame at a time, and effectively smudges the image to remove the pixels that are graining. I personally like to go heavier with temporal and then do a little bit of just brushing over with spatial otherwise the image comes out quite plasticky. So how do we know how much noise to apply to our image? Let's start with our temporal noise reduction. Frames at either side is how many frames forwards and backwards that it looks at to determine whether your pixel is green or whether it is the correct color. If you go more more than three is really gonna lag your computer up and I found it's a little bit unnecessary. Motion estimation, better. Noise reduction is quite a heavy process. You really don't want to be skimping out on it and getting basically a bad image out of the work that you're doing. Motion range, we can leave on small and then jump down to temporal threshold. This is where we set our limits. And we really want to start paying attention to our graph now because this isn't something that we want to overdo. Uncheck this. It's going to allow us to move these independently. And you want to look at your graph. And basically, as you pull this, you will see that your graph becomes less noisy, it, it gets much sharper. So we'll start with Luma threshold, which is the brighter parts of our image generally. And you can see that we only need to move it a little bit to really 
sharpen up our image. And any more than 10 is going to basically smudge our image more, but it's not actually going to produce any more noise because that's the point at which the graph stops changing. And we're going to do the same for chroma threshold. You can see this really isn't doing very much, so we don't need very much of it. I'm literally going to leave it down there at five. Then we want to jump over to spatial. You can see here that we have some modes again. I'm going to go for better again. And radius is best left at small. Then we jump down to spatial threshold and we complete the same process again. We uncheck Luma and we just have a look at how our graph is getting affected by this and where it looks sharpest. So we, again, we only need a tiny amount of this. And again, same process with Chroma. Only a tiny amount is needed. What we can then do is if we click on our highlight again, but switch to A slash B, we can see the difference that this node has caused to our image. And you can see that we have basically removed noise. As you look across this, you can see white noise that has come out of our image. This is great. If your image is starting to look like this and you can see like the outline lines of people, then you've gone too far. You've lost detail. The edges are getting smudged. So if I control Z that to get us back, you can see that's how you want it to look. You want to see noise and very little amounts of detail that are being lost from it. And that's how you ace noise reduction. So with this all set up, you now want to have a look and make final tweaks because every single one of these is going to play with your image. So it's worth having a final check and moving things back. Now I can see that we have a lot of saturation going on here by how far everything is split apart there. So I'm actually going to knock a little bit of saturation out of this. And the changes are going to be quite laggy because the amount that's going on past this point. And I'm actually going to bring a little bit out of the shadows as well on that first node, just to bring it back. And finally, I think that I am just going to take a little bit of brightness out of the skin tones at the top there on our second node that we made. Once you're happy with your image, then you can jump over to your timeline and you can frame up your image how you want. Now, the nice thing about DaVinci Resolve is that we have one more tool. We've obviously gone way below a 1080p image by zooming in, cropping, losing the bad bits around the edge from all the flickering that was going on. But what we have down at the bottom is super scale. And this is how you bring back a lot of detail to your image. Again, it's very computationally intense, but this on 2x is basically just going to enhance your image up. It's going to sharpen intelligently the bits that you want sharper. And it's just going to do a very good job of basically bringing this image back to looking very good. And you can see all this stuff was burnt out before and is now looking a lot better. If I were to turn this on and off, you can see our before and our after is much, much better. Now, what we can do is right click on this clip and render in place. And ProRes is gonna retain a lot of information. You don't want render at source resolution most of the time. Press render. You can see this is a very intense bit of rendering that's gonna happen. I can usually blast out most stuff very, very quickly. And this is why you wouldn't want to render out the clip with all the stuff that you're not gonna end up using. This render in place is actually why it was very important to have your timeline at the same frame rate because we will be keeping this clip at 119.88 FPS, which means we can do all the slowing down, all the cool stuff, all the effects to it later. And because it's in ProRes, you can even make adjust tweaks to the way the image looks in terms of the color, if it needs to fit in with the rest of your footage that you're playing, or you just wanna make minor tweaks once it's on the timeline, you can get a vibe for everything that's going on. But with that, we have covered absolutely everything that you realistically going to need to know in order to recover pretty much any damaged piece of video that you come across. See you soon.